the third generation full hybrid only Honda HRV brings its own formula to the small SUV crossover segment. It's more expensive than most competitors and less roomy than some, but for customers prioritizing cabin sophistication, interior flexibility, and powertrain efficiency, it might well be worth the extra outlay. It's taken some time for small SUVs to fully get on board with the current electrified automotive zeitgeist, but things are gradually changing. Take this car, Honda's third generation HRV, now only available in eHEV full hybrid form. The Honda HRV hasn't previously set the world alight. The original version of 1999, dubbed by Honda the Joy Machine, was very much an outlier model, an oddball that back then appeared to be the answer to a question that nobody had yet asked. In hindsight, perhaps this was a car simply that was ahead of its time, let down by lack of marketing and an absence of a kind of visual pizzazz which would characterise the segment-defining Nissan Duke 11 years later. It was a wasted opportunity, not least because when that original HRV was withdrawn from sale in 2006, it wasn't replaced in Europe. By the time the successor model was launched in 2015, the market had moved on dramatically and the small SUV crossover segment was booming. Yet even after a far-reaching update in 2019, sales were relatively modest, partly because the Mark II design lacked the overtly fashionable looks of trendier segment rivals, partly because Honda's price positioned that car towards the top end of the small SUV sector and partly because production numbers were limited by the Mexican factory's priority to satisfy the American market. In the meantime, the segment has grown considerably with almost every brand these days offering a model in this sector. Uh, there's now more choice in how your small SUV or crossover is propelled to. In this class, diesel is these days very much a niche option. You're much more likely to be choosing from petrol, mild hybrid, full hybrid and plug-in hybrid models. And this intensely competitive marketplace is where this third generation Honda HRV has to compete. This car was launched in late 2021. But it does at least offer something different, as is often the case with Honda. The HRV brings its own formula, a full hybrid only SUV with fresh looks and what's claimed to be one of the most family friendly and flexible interiors from a larger than class average body shell. But it will need all those attributes because it is positioned at the upper price end of the segment. With the competition fierce, does Honda's contender have what it takes to warrant some serious consideration? here. Well, Car and Driving's road test, the industry's most comprehensive review, will find out. Take a seat behind the wheel and there's no key, just a power button to the right of the steering wheel. Press this and the virtual dials on the screen uh, perform a few perambulations. The words ready to drive appear on the left hand gauge and you're ready to go. You don't tend to expect too much in terms of drive dynamics for a car in this class, uh, particularly from a full hybrid, which is what this car now has to be, and particularly from a Honda HRV, which was a bit of a pleasure-free zone in its last generation form. But the Japanese maker presents this as a crossover engineered for the joy of driving, and it even draws parallels with the hybrid engine it supplies to the Red Bull Formula One team. So we were hopeful that this car might regain gain some of the peppiness that we distantly remember uh, which characterized the turn of the century first generation model. It's fairly clear from the get-go though that this is a car for pragmatism rather than performance, although that doesn't mean it can't be enjoyable in its own way. Uh, quite a few of the ingredients here actually work very well, the highlight being ride quality, and that's aided by sophisticated suspension that's bolted to a more rigid platform. In fact, the way that this car cossets you over porous surfaces might easily sell you on it, uh, the ride being soft but well damped, the whole setup supple enough to easily absorb 
bumps while controlling body roll through the corners. Uh, the vague steering won't encourage you to push very hard through those turns, but if you do so, you'll find plenty of traction and some of the feel of a larger, more expensive SUV. But what you're really going to need to get used to if you're going to choose this car is the way its rather unique petrol engine works. Uh, a self-charging hybrid of the full-fat sort rather than the token effort mild hybrids that brands like Ford, Suzuki and Kia provide in the segment. Uh, Honda calls it an EHEV and it comes in one variety only with CVT auto gearbox and front wheel drive. It's the same 1.5 litre four cylinder twin electric motor power plant we've already seen in Honda's Jazz Super Mini, but here to cover off the HRV's extra weight, there's a bigger battery, one kilowatt hour as opposed to 0.86 kilowatt hours and power is boosted by 21 PS to 131 PS. The full hybrid powertrain format the market's most familiar with is the planetary gearbox system that was developed by Toyota, but this setup's different. Uh, the idea is to make the car far more like a full EV. Now you can't plug it in, but battery power is certainly in play far more of the time than is usual in a self-charging hybrid. Uh, the engine only actually drives the wheels when full power is needed, and even then it usually gets some electrical assistance. Otherwise its role is to drive a generator which keeps the battery topped up so that the electric motors can supply forward motion to the front axle. In theory, more time spent in EV motion means a quieter drive, and sure enough, when it's being driven very gently, the HRV is indeed quiet, smooth, and pleasantly responsive, with just a gentle hum from the electric motors. Flex your right foot to even a modest extent, though, and the piece is very definitely broken with a cattle like moo, which frequently cuts in and out, and which you would tire of very quickly if you were to continue to drive in that manner. Uh, there is also a return to the early days of elastic band style CVT auto gearboxes, uh, which initially reacts to a significant right foot prod by soaring the rev skywards without much in the way of actual forward motion. Selecting the most urgent of the three provided drive modes, Sport doesn't help very much, but you'll need this if you're going to try and replicate Honda's quoted stats, 62 from rest in 9.4 seconds on the way to 109 miles an hour. Thanks to the EHEV powertrain's useful 253 Nm torque output, that's actually a couple of seconds quicker than the old 1.6 litre IDTEC diesel model, but for the reasons we've already given, it doesn't feel like it. So, better instead to settle back into the two more sensible drive settings, Econ or Normal, and drive this car with more decorum, at which point you'll begin to like it much more. Maybe at this point you'll also want to play with the paddles behind the steering wheel that alter the amount of regenerative braking, but you'll quickly tire of doing that too. Firstly because none of the three levels appear to uh, much alter off-throttle deceleration, and secondly because your selections are overridden by the car after a short time, which can be frustrating. If you want to maximise the energy recuperation benefits of brake energy regeneration, it's easier to simply click the gear lever into its alternative B drive position. Anything else you need to know? Well, the brand's very complete package of Honda sensing camera safety features is very welcome, but the road departure mitigation element can be annoying on a secondary road uh, like this one, flashing its white warning dash screen message with annoying frequency. Uh, the bright red power button can be distracting too, but you would forgive this car a great deal for its great driving position as a typical Honda strong point. Arduous use is broadly beyond this HRV's remit. Uh, you won't be able to pull much more than a tonne, even if you could get a tow bar fitted, which wasn't possible at launch. And there's no four-wheel drive option of the sort that you can have on one of the rival full hybrid models in this class, the Toyota Yaris Cross. But that'll be no great loss to the typical customer demographic here who, like this HRV, will have no off-road aspirations at all, which is just as well because even with extra grip, you wouldn't get very far due to the extremely modest ride height. There's only 150 millimeters of it when the car's fully loaded. So, how to sum up? Well, if the slow-moving urban jungle isn't your natural habitat, then we suggest a very long test drive before you sign on the dotted line. But if it is, then this Honda's an admirable tool for school-run suburbia, and very much a sign of the times in its segment.
Here's a car that's very much of the moment, a crossover SUV which combines this genre's higher stance with a raked rear window and design details likely to appeal to many customers in the market for a smallish SUV offering a reasonable combination of practicality and panache. Although it shares its underpinnings and much of its engineering with Honda's Jazz Super Mini, the HRV is, to all intents and purposes, a clean sheet design. The smartest volume brand model in the segment? Well, we would subscribe to that view. You may not. These things, after all, are subjective, aren't they? An unusual touch here at the front is this body-coloured grille, although there is the option of having it finished more conventionally in black if you'd prefer. Uh, for reasons we don't really understand, top advanced star models get it with a curious Russian flag-style coloured motif. A mean-looking, slender, high-set headlights flank this main appendage, and the Honda H badge is ringed in blue to indicate that this is a hybrid. Further down, a nearly full-width honeycombed air intake is flanked by fog lights on higher-spec models, and there's a silver mock skid plate below in an attempt to create a more rugged appearance. If you're wondering why this Honda costs a bit more than obvious rivals, get out your tape measure. It's 110 millimeters longer than a Renault Capture E-Tech 145, 135 mils longer than the Hyundai Kona Hybrid, and a full 160 mils longer than the Toyota Yaris Cross. It's also 20 millimeters lower than the previous generation HRV, with a 20 millimeter reduction in front and rear overhang length too. Compared with the competitors we just mentioned, this Honda is quite unfussy in profile. A single crease running from the base of the clamshell bonnet uh, across the front door handles and into the rear lights. Uh, the neat appearance is accentuated by hidden rear door handles and the large 18-inch wheels that you have to have across the range. These sit in black plastic clad arches which are accentuated by circular upper creases. The top spec version swaps this silver trimming sill strip for one in red and adds a contrast coloured roof. The back is equally neat and understated with slim wraparound rear lights and an even slimmer bar running between them, a uh, part rear light and part contrasting trim with another blue tinged Honda H badge in the centre. There's a subtle roof spoiler with a shark fin antenna just beyond, uh, while lower down black trim rises up to cover most of the rear bumper. Underneath, the HRV is built on the Honda Global Small Car Platform, which uses more high tensile steel than before, and an extra ring structure around the centre of the cabin to provide a 15% more rigid structure, which is safer and also contributes to better suspension control and refinement. So the exterior is smart, if not particularly distinctive. Does the interior follow a similar theme? Let's find out. Anyone switching from the previous generation HRV will feel they've jumped forward a decade. Now you might not mistake this for a premium brand model, but there is an impressive sense of calm and cohesion here, and it's aided by the almost unbroken horizontal trim strip which runs across the front of the cabin, the centre of which is topped by this high-mounted 9-inch touchscreen. Horizontal vents stretch across the fascia just above it, while lower down it's unusual to note that there's no centre stack. In its place this unusual swirling strip, chrome plated above base trim, uh, encircles the gear lever with storage areas above and below. Ambiance wise there's a choice of rather dark and dour as here, or the rather questionable contrast coloured brightness of top advanced style spec which adds curious orange trimming around the transmission gate. Clearly aware that the low rent cabin of the previous model put people off, the brands tried a bit harder with materials this time around, but not quite hard enough as is evidenced by the brittle plastic you'll find on the dash top and the glove box lid. Still, a step forward has been made by Honda standards. There are some pleasant faux leather surfaces and piano black trim decorates the steering wheel spokes, uh, the gear selector and the window switch panel. Plus, silver highlights feature on the doors, the dash and on these discreet L-shaped corner dash vents fitted above base trim, neat little vent controls offering a diffuse setting which promises to spread the air more evenly around the cabin. 
As usual on Honda, the driving position is exemplary and everything falls uh, instantly to hand. There's almost no clutter in the cabin too, despite the retention of physical buttons for the climate controls and with the exception of the rather over-prominent dash dimming button to the left of the steering wheel, there's logical orderly layout which is backed up by what feels like excellent build quality from the Yorei factory in Japan. Onto that 9-inch Honda Connect central touchscreen we mentioned, it's a vast improvement on the previous generation model's slow, small and clunky setup. This time around we're happy to report that it's bright, clear and logically arranged, as well as decently quick to respond. In the center there are eight large icons and they change according to the so-called page that you've scrolled left or right to view. The first set of options cover key features like navigation, audio, phone and apps. On subsequent pages, there are icons for features like vehicle settings, the trip computer, and a Wi-Fi hotspot. These page layouts can be customized, and there are shortcut buttons in strips at the top and bottom of the screen that mean the most common features can be quickly accessed, regardless of which icons are actually in the center of the display. The inclusion of some physical control buttons helps too, so changing the volume can be done in an instant, while home and back buttons make it easy to find your way around the monitor without aiming your finger at the touchscreen itself. Uh, you'll get wireless Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring, and there's also a much improved voice command system. Uh, it's the Honda Personal Assistant that was first seen on the little Honda e. This is basically a next generation voice control system in that it can respond to multiple commands. For example, OK Honda, find me an Indian restaurant with Wi-Fi and free parking. Looking through the steering wheel, there's an unusual combination of a physical speedometer dial on the right and a configurable information screen on the left. There are no configurable screen styles or GPS mapping options, just a whole list of ways you can display information in the left-hand virtual dial. Now, you'll usually keep it as a power charge meter, but you can also choose a power flow meter or switch to readouts for fuel, speed, audio, phone, navigation, or safety systems. The steering wheel has the usual controls for audio, driver display information selection, plus buttons for the adaptive cruise control and for lane keeping assist. We mentioned the driving position earlier. This time around you sit 10 millimeters higher than before, which gives you a more SUV-like view forward. Uh, that and the relatively slim A-pillars help your view at junctions, but the view rearwards is compromised a bit by the slightly shallow roof line, so you'll be glad of the standard parking sensors and the rear view camera. Uh, there's plenty of height adjustment for the seats, but disappointingly, there's no lumbar support. They do, though, recline to an almost completely flat position, and that makes it potentially possible for the front passenger to enjoy a nap on longer journeys. Uh, the wheel doesn't move as expansively, but a comfortable position is easy to find. Storage is okay, but far from class leading. There's a good sized glove box, a lidded bin between the seats, and a couple of cup holders with a small oddments tray to the right of the steering wheel, uh, presumably for non-valuables because the lack of a lid means things could fall out. Earlier we mentioned cubbies in the center of the dash, uh, this phone tray and the 12 volt socket ahead of the gear lever, plus a small storage shelf below the air conditioning controls with USB-A sockets on either side. Uh, the small front door bins can each just accommodate a small drinks bottle and as uh, seems to be the norm nowadays, there's no sunglasses compartment. There is a ticket holder on the facing side of the driver's sun visor and there are map lights in the ceiling next to the e-call SOS button. Let's move now to the rear where, as I mentioned earlier, the doors are accessed by these hidden upper catches, loved by east seats but loathed by short children. Uh, we've already mentioned that the HRV is longer than its key full hybrid rivals, so in theory there should be plentiful room in the back. Let's find out if that's the case. Well, there's certainly plenty of legroom, helped by a lot of space between the floor and the bottom of the front seats. In fact, there's 35 millimetres more legroom than there was in the previous HRV, 
and the seats themselves are nicely contoured, although not super supportive. The outer two positions are, of course, very much the preferred place to be. Anyone seated in the middle will find themselves perched on a rather flat and raised cushion and reaching for belts integrated into the ceiling, although at least they'll have some leg space because of the flat floor and the positioning of the centre console here. Headroom might be at a bit of a premium for taller folk. You can blame the so-called sporty roof line for that. And the headrests are of the kind that dig into your neck or back unless they're raised upwards. Uh, the passenger sat behind the driver may need to be careful they don't drop anything into this uh, curious gap next to the belt buckle at the base of the seat. What else? Well, there are air vents in the centre console, plus two USB-A sockets if you avoid base trim, and an obvious tray, which is the right size for a mobile phone or two. Uh, the door speakers are large, so there are no door bins, just deep hollows that are only big enough to hold a 500ml bottle or a phone. However, there are also two cup holders in this generously sized central armrest, and two bright circular lights in the ceiling. The rear grab handles both have coat hooks and on the two top models you'll get seat back pockets. Uh, base elegance trim only gives you one on the passenger side which does seem a bit mean. These rear seats don't slide or recline but they are of the Honda Magic variety so feature the brand's party trick folding mechanism. That means the seat base can be flipped up towards the back of the car, cinema seat style, enabling taller objects like an electrical item or that tall plant you've just purchased from the garden centre to be carried behind the front seats. Finally, let's take a look in the boot. Now, if you remember the body length dimension as we mentioned earlier, you'll be expecting this to be class leading. So it comes as a bit of a surprise to find uh, that the tailgate, which is power operated above entry level trim, rises to reveal one of the smaller trunks in the sector, 319 litres in size. It's not much worse than the 326 litre capacity which is on offer from the Renault Capture E-Tech Hybrid 145, but it's some way down on the 374 litres provided by the Hyundai Kona Hybrid and the 397 litre figure somehow offered by front wheel drive versions of that little Toyota Yaris Cross. At least the opening is wide and deep and the lips pleasingly low, which should make uh, it easy to move heavier or bulkier items in and out. It's worth also twisting your dealer's arm to throwing this durable plastic load liner we've been trying here. Without that in place, you'll be able to lift the leading edge of the cargo base and access the narrow underfloor compartment, which adds an extra 16 litres of capacity. Everything behind is taken up by the drive system, so there's no space space for any sort of spare wheel. The boot is certainly practically sized with a recessed area to the left, uh, lights on both sides, four tie down points and a bag hook on the left. Uh, the mesh upper tonneau cover sits on runners so it'll conceal luggage even when it's loaded up to the window line, although it does feel rather flimsy. It's a shame Honda hasn't included either a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 seat back split. As a result, if you have a couple of rear passengers, uh, longer items will have to go on the roof. Uh, given the price here, it's also annoying that Honda doesn't provide cargo sidewall catches. So to most easily drop the 60-40 split rear backrest, you'll have to go around to the side. Still, at least there you'll be able to better appreciate the other advantage of that magic seat folding mechanism we mentioned earlier. Uh, this neatly cantilevers the seat base when it folds, so you get a completely flat load area, although it's still not a very large one. The 987 litre figure is two to 300 litres down on some rivals. In short, the useful seat flexibility costs you a little in capacity, but Honda owners will tell you usually that the trade-off in usability is worth it. HRV buyers get a straightforward choice of three trim levels, all offered with the same full hybrid powertrain. We'll quote launch prices applicable at the time of this test in early 2022. The range starts off with elegance trim that's priced at around £27,000. Another £2,200 or so gets you into this mid-level advanced variant, while the range topping advanced style version costs just under £32,000.
In terms of the Honda SUV hybrid range, the HRV slots in between the little Jazz Crossstar, that's priced from around 24,000, and the mid sized CRV, which is priced from around 31,500. If it's an HRV you want, competition from other brands will be models at the upper end of the small SUV segment. And there aren't that many in this class that can also offer the kind of full hybrid self charging powertrain that you get here. Don't be diverted by cheaper so called hybrid models in the segment which actually only offer mild hybrid technology. Cars like the Ford Puma, uh, Kia Stonic and Suzuki's Vitara and S-Cross. That's not the same thing at all. The kind of full hybrid powertrain we have here delivers a completely different level of tech. The main difference being that it allows the car to run on battery only drive for short periods. Now at the time of this test, uh, only four other small crossover contenders in this class could offer that kind of powertrain. Uh, there's the Renault Capture in E-Tech Hybrid 145 form, the Hyundai Kona in 1.6 litre full hybrid guise, and two models from Toyota, the Yaris Cross and the CHR. All of these alternatives are smaller, none can match this Honda's magic seat folding functionality and none of them uh, will run in EV form for as long, although as we'll see later that isn't actually reflected in the efficiency figures. Most though are cheaper than an HRV. The closest option in terms of size is a capture in E-Tech Hybrid 145 form. Uh, that offers a sliding rear bench, very similar boot space to an HRV, and an asking price a couple of thousand pounds less than a base HRV. At the time of this test, the Hyundai Kona Hybrid, that would save you nearly £3,000 on this Honda, but that is a slightly smaller car, as is a Toyota Yaris Cross, which at the time of this test would save you around £4,500 over an HRV. Uh, the Hyundai and the Kona both somehow give you more boot space, uh, but you will really notice they're more compact size if you take a pew on the back seat. The same, by the way, is true of the other full hybrid small SUV in the class. That's Toyota's style conscious and rather less practical CHR, which costs from around £28,000. The larger than class average size and the relatively high list price of this Honda means you may be tempted to go for an SUV or a crossover from the mid-sized Nissan Qashqai and Seat Attica class just above. There some full hybrid models are available for a similar outlay as a higher spec HRV if you're happy to accept a lower equipment level in exchange for more space, particularly in the boot. In that larger category, uh, we would pick out a couple of full hybrid options for you to consider. At the time of this test, a Renault Arcana with the E-Tech full hybrid powertrain, well that started at around the price of a top spec HRV, around £31,500. At about the same sort of price level, you might also want to look at uh, less generously equipped versions of Nissan's Qashqai in e-power form. But assuming you've opted to go for an HRV, what kind of equipment is on offer for the money? Well, as we said, the range kicks off with the Elegance trim level, and that provides LED headlights, 18 inch alloy wheels, keyless entry and start, plus a rear camera along with front and rear parking sensors. Inside, there are heated front seats, plus a nine inch center dash Honda Connect touchscreen, which offers Android Auto and wireless Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring. You also get high beam support, auto dipping headlights and adaptive cruise control. Plus, it's nice to see that you don't have to pay extra to get the magic seats. Moving up to this mid-range advanced version, which is expected to make up around 60% of sales, uh, they add a powered tailgate with hands-free operation, uh, front LED fog lights, auto tilting exterior mirrors, and a glossier window garnish, while the windows can be closed and the mirrors folded using the key fob. Uh, there's also a much nicer feeling cabin with Honda's almost unique air diffusion system, and that's designed to spread the air more evenly around the cabin in concert with dual zone air conditioning. The interior's more upmarket air comes courtesy of silver decorative panels, upgraded synthetic leather and fabric upholstery, and a leather gear selector. Plus, you'll also get a heated windscreen, a heated leather steering wheel, uh, an auto dimming rear view mirror, and a six speaker audio system with front tweeters. Rear seat passengers, well, they gain two USB A sockets plus an additional storage pocket in the back of the driver's seat.
The top advanced style derivative is set apart by a two-tone roof, red trim highlights, a coloured grille logo, smoked rear lights and roof rails, plus you get LED cornering lights and two-tone mirrors. Inside, advanced style trim gives you a lighter cabin with lighter dash trimming, light grey synthetic leather and fabric upholstery, and some rather dubious orange highlights around the steering wheel and the gear shifter. Uh, more usefully, the top spec trim includes a premium 10 speaker audio system and also a wireless phone charger. All HRV customers get a year's access to the My Honda Plus smartphone app, which aims to keep owners connected to their cars remotely. Uh, like most such apps, this one can let you lock or unlock the car from wherever you are, and it'll alert you if the alarm goes off. The app also provides location monitoring and car tracking via GPS to provide anti-theft peace of mind, and an intelligent geofencing feature, which allows preset geofence zones to be activated so that when, if you should loan the car out, say to your son or daughter, uh, you'll be alerted on your smartphone if they've ventured too far in it. Uh, the app will also allow you to plan journeys in advance on a phone or a tablet and then download them directly into the car when you get into it. Also available for the first year is a digital key feature uh, that makes it possible to use a smartphone to lock and unlock the car's doors, uh, to turn the power on, to operate the windows and to receive status notifications. You will have to pay extra for these services from year two of ownership of course. Talking of paying extra, on to options now. Uh, if you're not smitten with the sand khaki pearl standard colour, you'll have to shell out for one of the five optional metallic or pearl colours, such as the premium sunlight white pearl of our test car. And the only other factor options offered are also primarily cosmetic, uh, comprising 18-inch wheels in different finishes and a premium upholstery option which finishes the seats in a combination of classic grain leather and an Alcantara-like soft material called Alston. If you want a more dynamic look and feel for your HRV, Honda wants you to consider its four styling packs. Now, two of the packs allow you to change just the exterior. The Sport Pack introduces a different front bumper and a black front grille, together with rear decoration, side lower decorations, and a tailgate spoiler extension. The alternative Obscura Black Pack, that also gives you the black grille, plus lower decoration at the front, the rear and around the fog lights, along with a set of door mirror covers and a tailgate spoiler extension. Uh, slightly more subtle is the Ilmanite Titanium Pack. Now this includes tailgate decoration, fog light decoration, uh, door mirror covers, steering wheel and gear shift decoration, plus different door switch panels. If you like that colour theme, then you'll want to carry it through into the cabin, uh, and that's the Ilmanite Titanium Interior Pack, and that adds Ilmanite Titanium trimming around the gear stick, the steering wheel, and also the window switches. There's also a wide variety of accessories available for the HRV uh, with a focus on enhancing practicality. The cargo pack gives you a boot tray with dividers, tailgate illumination and boot sill decorations. We've got a straightforward anti-slip boot tray on this test car and you could add in a roof carrier, crossbars and a dog guard. An illumination pack gives you footwell spotlights and illuminated door scuff plates and you can also add premium floor mats, rubber mats, tailgate illumination, rear privacy glass and USB chargers in the rear if your HRV doesn't already have those. You can also add side body trims a windscreen cover for icy mornings and a dash cam drive recorder. Uh, there was unfortunately no tow bar available though at launch. On to safety now. The HRV is built around the same global small platform structure as the smaller Jazz, using much the same very strong ACE body structure that let us stand for advanced compatibility engineering. This uses a network of connected structural elements to distribute crash energy more effectively through the front of the vehicle in the event of an impact. And that reduces the forces that are transferred to the passenger compartment. 
As for camera safety kit, well, the brand's really upped its game in recent years here, thanks to its Honda sensing technology. Uh, proactive safety equipment featured quite prominently on the last generation HRV model, but there the active features were driven by a radar system. A wide view camera can offer much more these days when it comes to this sort of thing. So Honda has provided that here, and that enhances the safety system's field of vision and it allows more nighttime operation. Uh, for example, the collision mitigation braking system, uh, that is Honda's autonomous braking setup, and that replaces the previous city brake active system. This can now detect pedestrians when there's no street lighting and it can alert the driver when it detects errant cyclists. In addition, uh, collision mitigation braking now applies the brakes when the HRV cuts across or turns into the path of an oncoming vehicle. As we mentioned earlier on, uh, a high beam support auto dipping headlight system. Now that works uh, over 25 miles an hour and adaptive cruise control, they are also standard. If you've driven the previous generation HRV, you'll also quickly note how this one's road departure mitigation system now notices when you veer towards the road edge too, although it is rather too eager to alert you on secondary roads. It will also operate if you cross lane delineating centre lines without indicating, in which case a lane keeping assist system will gently steer you back to where you ought to be. Uh, traffic sign recognition, that is now another standard part of the sensing pattern. Package. and in this case it's a bit different because two road signs can be displayed at one time uh, one for speed another for highway instructions uh, no passing or no entry for example uh, this traffic sign feature also drives this HRV model's intelligent speed limiter uh, from the traffic sign recognition system this setup knows what the providing speed limit is and once uh, it's set it won't let you break it unless you persist on the throttle uh, Theoretically, it might make speeding tickets a thing of the past. What else? Well, low speed braking control uses sonar sensors at either end of the vehicle to detect if there's a danger of a potential collision with a wall or another obstacle during manoeuvring. Plus, it'll arrest the car and stop it from hitting something if the throttle is applied with too much force. An associated front and rear collision mitigation throttle control feature, that works in much the same way. Uh, avoid base elegance trim and you'll get two further camera safety features. There's blind spot information, and this stops you from dangerously pulling out if there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And there's also a cross traffic monitor, and that warns you of oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. As for passive safety features, well, we're a bit disappointed to see that the front seat doesn't feature the clever center airbag that you'll find in the smaller Jazz. This activates in a collision to reduce impact caused by contact between passengers. Uh, there's no knee bag either, although of course you do get the usual driver and passenger airbags, plus front side uh, full length side curtain bags. Uh, also standard are tire pressure monitoring, the usual e-call and emergency stop signals, as well as whiplash lessening front headrests, plus hill start assist and hill descent control, which will help you on steep slopes and low grip surfaces. Uh, three rear Isofix mounting points are fitted with top tethers for the outer two. It's easy to forget that Honda was a hybrid pioneer with its first hybridized model, the daring Mark I Insight, appearing very shortly after Toyota's original Prius at the end of the 90s. Uh, the brand followed that up with a more conventional Insight hybrid model and a hybrid Civic Saloon, uh, but it was then slow to build on that momentum. It's done so now though, and at the time of this test in early 2022, only the Civic hatch lacked any engine electrification. As we've said elsewhere in this film, you shouldn't confuse the full hybrid tech offered here with the token mild hybrid tech offered elsewhere in the segment. Uh, so it's particularly disappointing to find that this Honda's quoted efficiency stats, 52.3 mpg on the combined cycle and 122 grams per kilometer of CO2, are exactly the same as those of a mild hybrid Ford Puma in this class. Presumably that is down to this HRV's extra size and weight. 
Uh, whatever the truth though, those stats lead this car well short of the readings that you could expect from the three other main full hybrid contenders in the segment. And that's hard to understand given Honda's insistence that its eHEV system is more sophisticated and leaves you in all electric drive for longer. But uh, be that as it may, the Toyota Yaris Cross manages up to 57.6 miles per gallon and 116 grams per kilometer of CO2. Choose the Renault Capture E-Tech 145 Hybrid and the figures are up to 56.5 miles per gallon and 113 grams per kilometer. For the Hyundai Kona Hybrid, you're looking at up to 57.6 mpg and 112 grams per kilometer. Honda says the engineering focus with the HRV was on the total balance of how efficiently you can produce the electric power. In other words, in real world driving, the returns might be closer to the class norm than those stats would suggest, which is possibly true, but government revenue from cars is based on official WLTP rated CO2 figures, and so this Honda's higher CO2 reading will cost you in tax. HRV company car drivers will pay benefiting kind or BIK at a rate of 28%. Obviously, you'll need to regularly engage the selectable Econ Drive mode to get near to the stated figures and reach close to the theoretical 460 mile range that's possible from the 40 litre fuel tank. Uh, you'll also need to maximise regenerative braking either via the steering wheel paddles or uh, by engaging the gear sticks B drive position. Uh, plus, you'll also have to keep an eye on the instrument binnacle's selectable power charge meter, keeping the readout in the green charge zone or the lower part of the blue power section. Uh, there is additionally a power flow graphic that shows you at any time what's being powered by what. Further helping with frugality is the fact that Honda has gone to some lengths to ensure that the HRV slips through the air efficiently, as well as the obvious spoiler at the top of the rear window. The car has discrete lips at the trailing edge of the side sills and an air curtain slit in the front bumper. What else? Uh, well, the three-year, 90,000-mile warranty is better than the package that you'll get from most competitors. In addition, surface corrosion is covered for three years, exhaust corrosion, that's covered for five years, chassis corrosion is covered for 10 years, and structural corrosion for 12 years. Honda rightfully has a very good reputation for reliability, uh, particularly with models built in Japan, like the HRV. The brand makes it possible to budget ahead for scheduled maintenance and when the fixed price scheme, which is called five, and that covers servicing for a total of five years. It also adds an extra two years of maintenance and extended warranty for that period and roadside assistance breakdown cover uh, should the unexpected happen. This can also be transferred to a new owner if you sell the car before the service plan has expired. Onto insurance, and you'll need to set aside more to insure this Honda than you would its key rivals. Uh, the insurance group ratings for the HRV are between 30 and 31, which is somewhat higher than the Renault Capture full hybrid, groups 13 to 18, the Hyundai Kona hybrid, groups 8 to 9, and the Toyota Yaris Cross, groups 11 to 13. Residual values, though, are expected to be usefully better than many other small SUV segment rivals. Uh, residual value experts CAP reckon that after the standard three years and 36,000 miles, uh, this HRV will be worth 59% of its original value, which is better than the segment average of between 45 and 50%. Uh, that's a good result for Honda. This third generation HRV represents probably the most important step so far in the company's plan to electrify all its mainstream models. It certainly has a level of engineering sophistication which makes both its predecessor and most current small SUV rivals look rather old fashioned. But you pay a price for that. It'll be interesting to see just how many segment customers are prepared to front up for it. Those that are will get themselves one of the most advanced and practical small crossovers on the market with something old, the clever rear magic seats, and quite a lot that's new, the uniquely configured hybrid powertrain and the minimalistic dash with its much improved infotainment tech. 
We suspect that the HRV will either seem perfectly suited to you or oddly compromised. If you're looking for an easy-going companion that delivers a high degree of comfort and efficiency above that of conventionally powered alternatives, then this could be the car for you. However, you'll just have to be as easy-going because demands for acceleration introduce a level of noise which is a stark contrast to the sophisticated, calm cabin and the impressive ride quality. Still, there are compensations, primarily that clever magic seat system, which allows you to carry tall items which you would have to either lay flat or leave at home with rival SUVs. That makes up for the surprisingly small boot, some scratchy elements of cabin trim, and efficiency figures which, although they're frugal, aren't quite as good as we'd hoped and lag a bit behind rivals. For all that though, quite a few will see this Honda as a smarter choice, both in the driveway and in terms of its concept cleverness. The brand still isn't importing enough for it to become a mainstream choice, but then this was never going to be a high volume model. It would instead appeal to those who are in search of the cleverest and most versatile car of this kind. High fashion is all very well, but its charms do tend to fade. We think the appeal of this Honda is less likely to.